Britain. Rolling hills. Beloved gardens. Ancient woodland and heathland. But the British landscape is under attack. Phytophthora produces microscopic spores. Many, many thousands of these can be produced on a leaf surface. The organism then grows into the plant tissue itself, causing a blackening and a rotting, and therefore a death of the plant. They have found their way into public parks and even our very own back gardens. Can you imagine the UK without trees? I can't imagine the UK without trees and woods, and I hope no one else can. Scientists are working on ways to contain them. We have a range of tests that we have developed within the laboratories out into the field, which will enable us to identify what species there is using molecular biology techniques. Extraordinary measures are being taken to ensure they are contained before their effects are irreversible. Phytophoras are fungus-like pathogens that are causing extensive damage to our trees and plants. Typical Phytophora symptoms on rhododendron, as on many other ornamental hosts, are wilting and dieback of foliage. Other symptoms include a blackening of the leaf petiole, moving down the rib of the leaf to a classic dagger-shaped dark lesion. The leaf tip of this camellia shows a necrotic lesion with a paler green watery halo. Vaccinium, locally known as bilberry, winberry or blaberry, shows severe dieback and is often observed with prominent black banding visible on the stems. Larch trees show unseasonal dieback of needles on the branch tips and bleeding cankers may also be seen on the trunk towards the top of the tree. On beech and some other trees, Phytophthora causes dark bark lesions or cankers, usually on the lower trunk. A brown-black liquid seeps or bleeds from the lesions. So serious is the problem, a major government programme funded by DEFRA and administered by FERRA is underway to manage these destructive plant pathogens. The word Phytophthora means plant destroyer and as the name suggests, it attacks a plant and kills a plant, sometimes very, very rapidly. It can be any time from a number of years down to just a number of days. Phytophthora can spread in a, in a number of different ways. Um, the spores themselves, it can produce many thousands of spores in a very, very small area. Those spores can then be splashed or can be carried in wind-driven um, rain from plant to plant. People moving then, say, an infected plant from one um, infected area to a non-infected area potentially can carry that pathogen from one place to another. The other ways in which long-term spread can, can happen is the organism produces long-lived resting spores that can fall into the soil as the leaves fall off, drop off. If you're walking through an infected area, potentially you can pick up some of those, that, those spores onto your shoes. You then walk into an unaffected area, those, those spores can then be released and can affect susceptible hosts in that region. Gardens are really important for our UK economy. Even within the National Trust, we have over 15 million visitors annually visit our gardens. And looking around you actually now, you can see how plants make up this fantastic landscape. And many of these are actually very ancient specimens and actually heritage almost in their own right. So losing these would be quite a disaster. One of the most worrying Phytophthora is Phytophthora remorum. It's having a high impact around the country at the moment, particularly in the wetter west of the country. Um, it has a very, very large host range, and fortunately many of the plants around us are actually on that host range, so hence our concerns. One of the first things that we all need to do is to be aware of what to look out for when we're walking around our gardens or actually working in them. Know where your plants have actually come from, Maybe hold them back a while before you plant them. We would actually call that in the professional world as, as quarantining. But actually just holding them back before planting can make a difference because then you can pick up any disease that happens to show 
on that plant before it goes out into the garden. Because unfortunately, once these diseases are actually out into the garden, it then becomes a more difficult task to control them. There's a number of different things that we can actually do when you're within a plant collection or garden such as this really to prevent the spread of the, the disease or actually it coming in the first place. And they're quite, kind of quite basic things really. Overcrowding of plants, a disease comes into an overcrowded collection, it can take hold very quickly. So getting some air movement in and around the plants, making sure they're growing vigorously and healthily is always actually a good thing to prevent any disease from impacting. Another thing might be the path network. We'd have a look at that, making sure that it's actually made up well, it's constructed in the right way, there's plenty of drainage on it that isn't too muddy, it's swept regularly clean of leaves, and that again, that can actually prevent a disease traveling around the site. As we manage the garden, even things like cleaning tools and equipment on a, on a regular basis, little things like that can again um, prevent the spread of the disease around a site like this. And again, one of the most important things per perhaps really is to clean our footwear at the end of the day or actually again as you're moving from border to border. And actually everyone can play their part in that, whether you're a visitor or whether you're actually a person working in a great place like this. The message to the public is the key one. You know, this was a disease we brought in, people brought in, into the UK through garden plants. So we've got to get some messages out there about people taking more care about where they get their plants from. Don't go abroad and bring your plants back with you. And when you're going out walking into woodlands, just be a little bit more aware of notices that are out there that are advising you to do things. But also, simple things. You know, if you're, if you're going out for a walk, clean your boots when you get back from your walk that day before you go into a wood the next day. Just simple little things are going to help us. Because we don't want this disease spreading. So we are now taking much more care about observing our woods for signs of these new diseases. And what we all need to be is more vigilant. You know, everybody appreciates trees. They're the backdrop to our daily lives. They're on your journey to work. It's where we go for recreation during, uh, during the weekends. You know, a fantastic resource for the country uh, and, and, and for the people in the country. And it, it feels like a shot across the bowels, Remoran. And it's having a major impact. And who knows where it might go next. And I think that's the biggest worry and you know it just has to be it has to be controlled to safeguard plant health in britain there are statutory controls on importing plants and plant products into this country plants need passports too uh, we're, we're inspected uh, every other month by a thorough inspector, uh, but once a year in, in August, we, the whole nursery is thoroughly checked um, by our plant inspector, and then he follows that up by checking the, uh, the office, the paper trail in the office uh, for the plant passports and, and to make sure that all the information is put on there. Satisfied with all that, he will uh, issue us a plant passport for, to allow us to trade for the next year. We've altered many of the ways that we grow plants uh, on this nursery here, um, really with the whole objective uh, of n not having the disease, you know, minimising the uh, risk of infection and making the nursery environment uh, unfavourable for, for uh, remorum. We grow our plants on a very wide spacing uh, so that you, you have good air movement between the plants. Uh, we also use micro irrigation, drip irrigation and sand bed irrigation where possible and try and reduce the amount of overhead irrigation we do which has water splash and water runoff which can all be uh, points of contamination. Another thing is we, uh, we never keep any plants after their point of, uh, of flowering and sale here so that all stock is sold fresh and never kept on as old stock and a key thing to breaking uh, remorum life cycles is is not to have uh, old plants on your, on, on your nursery. And then finally, plant care is a big thing. And uh, so, you know, we're, we're very diligent in, in how we look and check our plants. Uh, any ones that are, you know, not looking well or, or have damaged tissue or anything like that, we either, you know, remove them from the nursery or, or, or tidy them up. The plant health right across the board uh, in this nursery is higher than it was uh, 10 years ago and that's been encouraged and pressurised because of the worry and risk of Phytophthora remorum. Nurseries have reduced the level of Phytophthora remorum interceptions to 0.01%, but it had spread into the wider environment. 
In 2009, Phytophthora remorum was found infecting Japanese larch and a small number of other conifer tree species in the southwest of England. By 2010, it had been found in Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. By the end of 2011, around 3 million larch trees had to be felled to try to control the spread of the pathogen. Funded by the government project, Ben Jones works with the Phytophthora remorum aerial surveillance and field diagnosis team. His team are the eyes in the sky. The use of the helicopter has been quite critical uh, in finding infection in tree species because invariably looking at, the, looking at canopies from a forest floor level is very, very difficult. However, looking from a helicopter gives us a unique perspective of looking down from above um, and enabling us to, to, to be able to pick up symptoms very readily, um, but also using a helicopter, it gives us the, the advantage of, of being able to investigate sites as well, as opposed to using a fixed wing aircraft. What we can do, we can cover large areas of ground um, in a short period of time, um, looking at, uh, at areas of larch, but also looking at other forest health um, issues as well, and collating and capturing data as we go. This is a, a very important, being able to collate that information, analyse it, and then produce maps to enable field teams to then go out and accurately and quickly pinpoint trees that will then, then be felled and sampled on the ground. One of our major roles is to educate both the public and professionals in this industry on all aspects of forestry and at the moment of course we have a great threat with Phytophthora on our forests and woodlands in Britain. Well woodlands and trees are such a fundamental part of the landscape in the UK and they affect all of us in every way and I think it beholds all of us at the moment to be much more vigilant on these new diseases and pests that are coming into our country and affecting both urban trees which can be a main carrier for these diseases and then into forests and woodlands. We all have a duty, I think, to actually be much more vigilant about how we're carrying out our business in woodlands. Now, this just doesn't include forest workers, contractors or even forest professionals. But every visitor to woodlands in the UK, be it dog walkers or mountain bikers or horse riders, we all use woodlands for recreation or for business. And I think we all need to take our biosecurity measures a lot more seriously than we have been in recent years. The public can do an awful lot, actually, to make sure that their boots are clean, uh, their mountain bikes are washed down when they leave one site before they go on to another one. But in particular, I think it's up to forest professionals and others, forest contractors, those who are working in the forest, to make sure that anyone who is here on official business takes proper biosecurity controls. That may mean on infected sites using actual disinfectant, but for other sites, I think you need to be vigilant on every woodland at the minute. It's really important, I think, that we're all very aware of the new diseases that have come into this country. In the last decade, there has been an awful lot more, a huge increase in tree diseases and pests than there was in the previous, uh, at the end of the last century. This is due, I think, a lot to globalisation. Britain is a trading country. We get an awful lot of new plants in. We get a lot of uh, wood packaging on materials in. There's also the threat of climate change. We don't know yet how that's going to affect current pests and diseases that are in this country. We don't know what new ones may yet arrive, but I think we're fairly sure to say that milder winters and wetter summers can only put more stress on trees and increase the likelihood of this happening. Forests and woodlands are just such a fundamental part of the British landscape. They mean so much to people for so many reasons. They provide jobs in a rural economy. They provide a place of solace for all of us to go and uh, they provide havens for, uh, for our, our rich biodiversity in the UK. With an increase of misty, wet and windy weather in the UK, perfect for spreading spores and infections, controlling Phytophthora is a priority for the conservation of the British countryside. I'm aware of uh, three different species of Phytophthora which have infected uh, heathland species. There's Phytophthora remorum, uh, Canovii and Pseudoseringi and they've all been known to infect the heathland plants, especially the um, Vaccinia myrtilis has, has been found to be specifically um, vulnerable, although in uh, laboratory tests I know things like even the Coluna has been found to be vulnerable and uh, I know Phytophthora pseudoseringi has been had causing major problems on uh, lowland heath 
in Canuck Chase. So if that sort of infection was replicated in a large upland environment like the Black Mountains where you have three, four thousand hectares of uh, bog and heath which are dominated by this kind of vegetation, you could see a huge loss of habitat and uh, a massive reduction in uh, the conservation value of many of Britain's uplands. If heathlands were to degrade across the, the upland environments of Britain, it will have a massive effect on tourism. The classic upland environment that people visit in the Brecon Beacons, in the Peak Districts and the Yorkshire Dales is dominated by heathland and should, you, should the heathland fringe be lost, the variety of the landscape, the the uh, classic kind of purple flowers of, uh, of the, the late summer in the upland Britain will be lost and that is what attracts a huge number of people to our hills. The potential impact that I think Jonathan was talking about earlier in terms of the loss of species, uh, that could be quite catastrophic on a landscape scale that we have a huge extent, some region of 3,000 hectares of heathland communities within the Black Mountains where we are today. If we lost that, and I believe the perception is increasing that it could be a long-term, if not permanent loss within the landscape, that will fundamentally change the veneer of this landscape from a very aesthetically pleasing heathland community to potentially a more uninteresting grassland community. There is a tradition in some of the restaurants around here, you will get Winbury pie. So again, if it's lost, you lose some of that connection to the hill. And once more, that would be a tragedy. We may not be able to eradicate the disease, but we must learn how to live with it and keep it under control. The quicker that we can nip these things in the bud, so to speak, the quicker um, the, the more we can protect our environment. I don't, we go to woods because we feel there's a timelessness about them. We go to woods because we feel they're, a ro they're robust. They, they've always been there. They're, they're almost holders of history, aren't they? That's, that's how, why I go and visit woods, because they're just such exciting places to go and visit. And that's why we need to get this message out. And that's why we all need to pay our part. It's not a field of a few hectares of ground, but a cause we're defending and whether we defeat the disease or learn to live with it, we all have an important part to play in protecting this beautiful land. <laughs>